water is essential to life on Earth. In fact, that's where life first emerged. And it took millions and millions of years for the genetic changes, the evolution process, to allow for life to move onto dry land. And different species, different subspecies, then were able to exploit exquisitely the different environments we have, um, whether they're very wet or very dry on our planet. In one of the very driest places on Earth, the Namib Desert, there's a beetle, the tenebrinoid beetle, and um, it, it never rains there. But this beetle has evolved an adaptation that allows it to harvest water from the air. A uh, thick fog rolls in from the Atlantic Ocean and hangs above this beetle. And the dimples on its carapace, on its back, allow it to condense out droplets of water. And when it gets thirsty, it does a headstand and uh, drinks the water. Incredible. But humans, too, have evolved, obviously, a terrestrial life. We, we breathe the air, we have um, waterproof skin, our reproductive system is uh, internal, and so on. But one human species, just one species, occupies every environment on this planet. And it doesn't do that through biological evolution. It does something, something very human. We have cultural evolution. So over thousands of years, we have developed adaptations with, our, with tools, with our culture, that have allowed us to exploit all these different environments. So for example, we, we are able to find food in a place where there's very little vegetation. We can make houses out of the ice in the Arctic, in the wet, flooded tropics we can float suspended on the water in order to, in order to carry out trade and, and, um, and we have stilted houses and so on. So our cultural evolution has allowed us to take over all, our, all the different types of environment, dry and wet, but we still need water. And we do something else very special as humans. We also change our environment to suit our culture and our cultural needs. So, in the desert, this is the Tar Desert in India, um, on, the on the edge of Pakistan and India, where there are no lakes. We have created our own artificial lakes. And you can tell how precious and how important water is in this very dry environment. Look how beautiful the step wells are here. There's an artificial lake. It's an underground lake where it's not going to evaporate. And actually, these are being cleared out now because people are recognizing the importance of water as we move, as populations expand into the dry uh, world. And we move rivers, we dam rivers, and we create artificial rivers, canals, to, to bring water to, from places where there's a lot of water to places where there is none. But the changes that we humans are making recent, in recent decades to our planet have been on such a scale, so global and in, so profound, that we're actually pushing our planet from one geological era, the Holocene into the Anthropocene, the age of humans. And this brings with it enormous challenges. There are vanishing glaciers, there's erratic, unpredictable climate, flash floods, drought. Our water supply is becoming, our fresh water supply is becoming uncertain and limited. And all this at a time of unprecedented human population. Many people around the world, millions, live at the very edge of survival. They, they don't have the capacity to cope with further environmental change. They risk losing their livelihoods or, or their homes, even their lives. So what are we going to do? How are we going to get fresh water in this new age? Well, I wanted to find out. So um, I spent two and a half years traveling around, maybe mainly the global south, for covering more than 40 countries, to try and find out how are we going to live in this new age? How are we going to meet the challenge of fresh water? And already, uh, more than a billion of us lack access to water. And what does that mean? Um, when you think about, when you think about um, access to water, you're probably thinking of something like this. But the reality is actually something like this. It's a jerry can, and they're ubiquitous across uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And going to find and fetch your water and, and is, 
is a factor of life across Asia, across Latin America, across um, Africa. And, and it's not just a health question. Not having enough water is not, just, um, it's not just important for health. It's also socially really important because if you are spending most of your time, a large part of your day, collecting water, traveling, bringing it, and all that, you are not being educated. You're not um, in a job. You're not looking after your family. You're not building your community. It's, it's a really major factor in poverty. So um, how are we going to get out of this? Well, you know, where there's groundwater they're, um, available already, um, charities, governments, and so on are, are now putting in pumps, which makes things a lot easier because um, water is much more accessible there. This is Uganda. Um, and, of course, it's used in agriculture. Irrigation around the world is done like this, not um, in, a spray, uh, in, a, in, a, in a spray hose like it is um, in the rich world. And, and that means malnutrition is less of a problem. But what about if you live in, uh, in where fresh water is not available? So up in the Himalayas, in the dry desert there, essentially, on the corner of India, Pakistan, and China, there's a remarkable community in Ladakh. And this is, this is a, a, a culture that has existed for centuries, and they have their own language, they have their own beautiful architecture, their own ways of doing things. But it's threatened now because global warming has brought the disappearance, the melting of glaciers. And people depend on these glaciers for, for drinking water, let alone for irrigation. But without Without that meltwater, they're then joining the great diaspora. They, they're, they're leaving um, their fields and um, they're moving to join the slums of Mumbai, of Delhi, and so on. So, so how are we going to keep these people <laughs> in, uh, for a little bit longer in this, in this uh, incredible environment? Well, one remarkable man has come up with an ingenious method of doing this. He has uh, dug... Um, uh, ditches uh, in the mountain, in the shadow of uh, taller mountains, to channel meltwater from higher up glaciers, some 6,000 meters above sea level. And the result is an artificial glacier, which amazingly uh, sets in the winter and then melts in the summer months. And it melts at just the right time for, uh, for the planting of um, fields. So they have amazing harvest there which they shouldn't which which shouldn't exist it shouldn't exist they the glaciers have melted above 4,000 meters, but above 6,000 meters, they're now using those, that glacial meltwater. And because of global warming, they're actually, they're actually reaping the benefits um, as well as uh, the negative consequences. So they're now able to grow a variety of crops. They can grow wheat, they can grow apricots, they can grow tomatoes. So um, people are coming back. They're coming back um, to join the communities. Um, uh, the farmers... Um, this is, a, this is a woman farmer that lives here. Her whole family has returned from uh, Mumbai, from the slums of Mumbai, to rejoin that community. And this is the remarkable man that did it, that, that made an artificial glacier high in the Himalayas. And he's not the only person who is creating glaciers um, high, in the, um, high in the mountains. In Peru, they have the same problem in the Andes where the glaciers are melting at an incredibly rapid rate. And what they're doing there is they're literally painting the mountain white in order to increase the reflectivity to reflect the sun's heat so that any precipitation that does land there gets a chance to freeze. Um, I mean, these are alpaca farmers, and they rely on glacial meltwater. This, this used to be where... Um, where a glacier once was, and they would rely entirely on that glacial meltwater to uh, irrigate their alpaca pastures. Um, and without it, they move to the slums of Lima. This is how much they've done so far. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's testament to the desperation of people that they are willing to paint a mountain white. Um, the people who have already left end up in Lima, and Lima is it's a growing slum. They don't, they, don't, they don't move into houses with piped water and sanitation. They are literally moving to a sand dune on the, outside, on the outskirts of the city. And Lima is the second biggest desert city in the world after Cairo. So um, they're paying for a premium for a truck to come and deliver water to them. So if you remember that beetle that I talked about earlier, 
that harvested water out of the fog. This is what they're trying to do here in Lima. They've, these are experimental um, uh, fog nets, and the idea is the enormous thick fog that hangs over the city, that rolls in from the Pacific, they are using these nets to try and extract, to condense out water. And at the moment, they're collecting it all in storage tanks um, for drinking and, and, and so on. But their idea is to irrigate tree saplings. They want to cr create a long-term solution to the problem. And so they're going to geoengineer an entirely new ecosystem here, a forest. And if you've been in a forest, you know that they're damp. In the tropics, they're even more damp because the leaves act like the beetle's carapace. They condense out the water. They create um, soil. They create um, an entirely different hydrodynamic system. So, so um, they're trying to do this. And it might seem like a crazy idea to, to create an artificial forest where there was none. But actually, 150 years ago, this geoengineering experiment started in, by a rather unlikely protagonist, uh, Charles Darwin. He was sailing around the um, oceans and he came across um, on his, be on his beagle um, expedition and he came across Ascension Island, which is essentially, it's, it's an incredibly remote island in the middle of the Atlantic and it's a volcanic island and it's just volcanic dust. There's very little vegetation, no water, um, it's pretty inhospitable, which wouldn't have been a problem apart from an English Navy battalion was stationed there to keep an eye on um, the exiled Napoleon who was on St. Helena. So Charles Darwin thought about this big problem that ships had to bring everything they needed. Um, and he and his uh, friend, Joseph Hooker, who was sailing around the world as well on a, on a similar, on a, a different expedition, but um, uh, also looking at natural solutions to problems, they came up with this idea of an experiment. And they contacted Hooker's dad, who happened to be the uh, director of the Botanic Gardens in Kew, and said to him, you know, uh, we would like you, every single ship that comes past Ascension Island to bring saplings or seeds or something um, from, from the Botanic Gardens, and we will plant it on that mountain. Well, an extraordinary thing happened within just a few decades. The most remarkable, unique forest that will ever be found on Earth, of a, a mishmash, a hodgepodge of all different types of experimental bananas and, and um, uh, bamboo, all different types of plants grew up there. It was able to, the, the forest created an entirely new ecosystem. That place is now called Green Mountain. It went from black volcanic rock to, it's called Green Mountain now on Ascension Island. The sailors were able to grow vegetable plots. The um, entire ecosystem changed, it became a wet, environment. Well, this is what they are trying to do in Lima. And if you stand next to one of these fog nets, it's an absolutely unbelievable experience. You can hear audibly really loud gushing of water coming down and hitting gutters there. So as we enter this new human age, we will need to rely as never before on our very human capacity to change our environment to change our societies and our culture in order to, to get enough drinking water in this new age. And we would do well to make sure that our environmental change is able to sustain the natural world as well. That's the end, thank you.